the greatest common factor between all my sources for today's video is that they all cited Adam Ellis's comic of Let People Like Things. Wow, that was a master. I was, what, 15 when cyberbullying and netiquette became a hot topic in my Catholic school? Considering I was the point and butt of that topic due to the tight-knit community of gossips and what most would consider normies in my school, I don't put much stock into it. So here's what happened. My peers and seniors prepared a play. It was student-made, student-directed, and all-around not very good. It was made by children. Are you really gonna argue quality? I was a cynic and had a variety of neuroses one would identify as depressed and anxious, and I was a beacon for people who shared the same sentiments about the play. We were all forced to pay for tickets and watch this play, which was terrible and only enjoyed by the actors involved. I dragged my sister to it, commiserated with fellow degenerates, and left soon after the play started. I then told my friend online that the play sucked so much my sister told me she'd leave without me if I stuck it out, so obviously I had to leave without finishing it. The next morning the campaign started and did not stop until I left campus due to people harassing my friends because they, the crew involved in making the show who were also in the student council, couldn't emotionally bother me. It's not that I wasn't hurt by what they were doing, but as mentioned, I was, and still am, depressed and anxious. That basically means that I already hated myself, so they couldn't really make my life more miserable than it already was. So, the people I cared about it was. Now, that little anecdote has told you one of two things. First is that I am very much open about things that I dislike and how much I do not like them. Second is how once your negative opinion reaches the internet, it is implicit permission for everyone who disagrees with you to go open season on you. And whatever criticism you have of past me, I, like them, do not care. It's done. I told you that because I had a point to make. And that point is that there are multiple dimensions to hate. Baby SJ was exhibiting what I would call cringe claiming. They were biased against the blade due to a number of factors, teenage angst being chief among them. Baby SJ has since graduated from that and has moved on to another, better dimension of hate, anti-fandom. And before you click away, <laughs> before you click away, I do want to distinguish anti-fandom from anti-shipping. Those are different, all right? For the uninitiated, Anti-shippers, in the most modern sense of the term, are fans who disapprove of a ship that they deem problematic and or morally wrong in some aspects. Anti-fandom, on the other hand. You see, that's the thing. The scholars themselves have kind of debated how to narrow down anti-fan behavior in order to properly define it, but like their understandings of fan behavior, that too has shifted. What was initially a binary between people who like the thing versus people who hated it has been queered, if you'll forgive the term. Scholars of recent years have limited anti-fan behavior into the following. Intense analyses, usually with constructive critique of chosen media and or its creator, and awareness raising of the criticisms, usually accompanied by gatekeeping. But in that sense, there wouldn't be much difference between an anti-fan and a critic, wouldn't there? Historically, anti-fans have been a lot more volatile, going so far as poisoning people. The idea and concept of an anti-fan would date back about as far as the first bit of iconography was a thing, but the actual term for it probably cropped up around the late 90s, early 2000s in Japan and South Korea's pop idol spaces. Don't quote me on that though. <laughs> That's just as far back as I can date it. There's nothing I can find in preliminary searches that would suggest otherwise anyway. In that sense, would the way scholars categorize anti-fans be fair to that? Death threats don't seem to be in the realm of still technically engaging in the same content the same way as fans now, does it? That's where I and this video come in. I'm going to be breaking down these dimensions of hate down to three categories. There is critique, there is cringe, and then there's trolling. These terms aren't academic. This is purely my take on it. You could have yours. I don't mind, but here's my main point. Get ready. 
hating something and hating the people who like it are two different things. Revolutionary, I know, but I'll proceed with the three so you can understand why it all gets a little muddied, intentionally or otherwise. Critique. Anti fandom as a critique usually ends in gatekeeping. Critics are incredibly familiar with the subject of hate, pause now for the full definition, and usually are fans themselves, or were. They have to in order to critique it, and once they have, they usually tell non fans or potential fans why they shouldn't get into it or shouldn't take it too seriously. The objectivity of these critiques might be a little suspect, but all in all, they're giving out these critiques out of the goodness of their hearts. Well, sometimes they give out the critiques because there is something in the text that pisses them off. It could be inaccuracies or misinformation or just straight up bad writing, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> the prime example of these kinds of anti-fans that most of my sources cited are Fifty Shades anti-fans. Usually people who are or were into BDSM who understand that E.L. James wrote what's essentially an abusive heterosexual relationship and will tell you not to put stock into the BDSM in the book series. The franker ones will tell you that E.L. James wrote rape fantasy fanfiction of a racist property. Another franker example would be for the Arcana. Now, I hesitate to put this here because I don't think a lot of people know what the Arcana is and who the creators are, but here's the breakdown. Arcana, full name The Arcana A Mystic Romance, is a mobile dating sim slash visual novel where you basically date whoever the hell you want among these six characters in this fictional world. You play as a tarot card reader who wakes up in a magic shop with no memory. It's very basic. If you're familiar with dating sims and isekai anime, you already know what it's like. What the hell? Why does this unsuspecting mobile game have anti-fans, you may ask? Well, according to their anti-fans, the creators aren't very decent people. Among the list of crimes is exposing minors to sexual content, racist fetishism, I don't think I have to say more. The bottom line is that these actions aren't old, as is the usual excuse fans have for creators who have been reformed. And for every in-game purchase you make, you're funding these harmful actions. Do fans still enjoy the Arcana despite all of this? Yeah, actually. With this type of reception to critical anti-fandom comes something I want to discuss, and that is how people treat it as less valid criticism because of the fandom part of it. Take for example what I just said, or if we want to go big or go home, JK Rowling and Isayama Hajime's anti-fans. For people who are unfamiliar in the audience, they're the authors of Harry Potter and Attack on Titan respectively. When marginalized people tell you that a creator or a piece of media is bigoted, oftentimes both, and that you shouldn't engage with it, that's not just anti-fan behavior. That's also straight up marginalized people telling you to not platform a bigot and to make sure that these bigots never have the chance to do any more damage to their communities by spreading these harmful messages, overt or otherwise. Jewish people, black people, all walks of Asian people, a lot of whom are trans, they've been telling you not to buy Rowling's books or even just put them on a pedestal for years now. Attack on Titan too, Jewish anti-fans who caught on to that fascist messaging fast, they've been saying that since 2019 and that's not even mentioning the Korean, Chinese, and Japanese people catching on to Isayama's nationalist sentiments while this was happening. That's not only valid critique, but I feel like these people have the right to gatekeep anyone else from coming into these fandom spaces unaware. At the very least, they should be able to say these things without the backlash that comes with it. But like I said in the fandom racism video, fans who disregard these please tend not to care and kind of just call it drama and say they're overcomplicating things or that fandom should be for fun. Who should be having fun? Huh? Cringe. Cringe, to put it plainly, is just bullying. Anyone familiar with bullying will understand that widespread bullying is outright hate and bandwagoning. People who assign your piece of media as cringe do not care what you think of it or what it means to you. The moment you say you like that thing, your cultural capital, that's academic speak for your taste, is very low. Cringe and critique have some things in common. Not a lot, mind, but cringe claimers 
The only real thing they have in common with critics is familiarity with the object of hate. A lot of the things people point to and call cringe are various and plentiful. <laughs> Taylor Swift, K-pop, Voltron, Homestuck, you get the gist. Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Dungeons and Dragons, and comic book fans of your like to think they're still part of this, but I don't know. I think in the queering of all things fanish, those media have become more mainstream and even a little less niche. There are still definitely cringy fans out there of those properties, but when you say I like comic books or I like anime, you're a lot less likely to receive flack from it than you would if you said something like I really like My Little Pony. Like if you lived in the cursed era, you wouldn't be able to call Game of Thrones cringe because it was European fantasy with tits. Very unoriginal, Dragon Age did it first. And everyone was into it, like everyone. Cringe as a category requires a level of nicheness and nerdery. The more niche it is and the more into it you are, like you know lines from every episode or know trivia about a character or person that isn't common knowledge, the more cringe you are. Now I've called this bullying because more often than not, neurodiverse fans are the butts of these jokes. Having special interest in something that isn't interesting to most neurotypicals ends up being cringy, and fanish behavior around such things ends up becoming viral as a meme. But there's a lot more to that. Because as I've said earlier, some critique and gatekeeping is earned and rightfully deserved, especially bigoted ones. Because along with neurodiverse fans being the butt of cringe jokes, it exists neurodiverge fans latching on to content that is very much bigoted, claiming that they can't help what their special interests are and primarily being the majority voice in the let people like what they like crowd. And like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Having someone critique the thing you're hyper fixating on may seem like a personal attack. For cringe claiming anti fans, it usually is. Like, I'm not gonna soften the blow for you. Some anti fans will call you cringe for liking bigoted content, despite the evidence of bigotry already presented to you. If your special interest is something like the aforementioned Harry Potter or Attack on Titan, or Dream SMP, or Genshin Impact, or K pop groups, or God forbid, Hamilton, as someone whose special interest is any of those, it would do you a lot of good to listen to the criticism, because a lot of it is not unfounded, and just because ableist assholes are making the critique doesn't make it any less true. Hearing what they have to say without a tinge of malice and wholly understanding it from where they're coming from, it might actually help you grow as a person. No more takes in bad faith, no more defending. When someone tells you that a property's messages is hurting minorities or that an apology from an influencer isn't genuine, they really would rather the event never happened at all and that your fabs aren't problematic. No one wants to stir shit up on purpose. Cringe claiming anti-fans have the inherent tendency to dogpile, mostly because fans in the fandom stay attack are relentless in their determination to stick with it. If Dream holds content and never pays an artist for making art for him, if any members of BTS is criticized for anything at all, if a celebrity or influencer claps back at someone unsuspecting in public. You know the horror stories, doxing, death threats, L plus ratio, etc. <laughs> it's no excuse for either side. The internet is an arena and everyone is at each other's throats. I get it. But some pools are a lot deeper than a glass and it might be worth checking out. Literal insert homestead joke here. Internet trolls are their own monsters. They either know what the hell they're doing and are deliberately pissing you off, or they're genuinely unaware of what the hell you're talking about. No in between. And I think it's that lack of awareness that really makes them kind of hard to predict. Personally, I'd pin some trolls down as not knowing they're being trolls, like white knights or some other performative activists out there. <laughs> Those come a dime a dozen, and that's where you get some of the most egregious things a group of anti-fans can do. Dogpiling. <laughs> this is what creators call cancel culture. A group of people who hate you and wear you down with threats or baseless insults. And the worst part of it is that this comes at the cost of having people who weren't even aware of your thing to come in and do the same thing that they're doing. But hey, this isn't that video. I'm not here to tell you as a creator how to not get fucked over by troll anti-fans. I'm just here to tell you that these people and these types of behaviors exist. 
end that. When a group of people crop up to say that they don't like what you're doing, there's going to be a reason behind it. Yeah, you have to develop thick skin as a creator, and it'll wear you down if you stay vigilant of things you never intended or set out to do. You still gotta make the effort to listen, though. That about wraps this up. I urge everyone who watched through this to read Anti-Fandom, Dislike and Hate in the Digital Age. I'll link where you can purchase it, probably, but I'll be giving supporters a free copy. Shout out to Jeanette, Evie, and all my lovely supporters. Without them, this video and the next would not be coming out this month, I am not gonna lie. So if you want to support me or see what went into the making of this essay, or hear bloopers, or read some other articles I found interesting in the making of this, or want early access, Come support me on Kofi, which, which, by the way, I'll be shifting towards Kofi by April due to some sneaking suspicions I have with Patreon's allegiances with crypto. You know how that is. Thank you so much for getting to the end of this video. Stay safe. Bye.